Welcome, fellow castigators. I had the pleasure of watching the first of three Doctor Who specials, this one titled The Star Beast, in very literal fashion. I will try and keep my summation brief so that we can get to the juicy bits. The special begins with David Tennant looking like Carl Sagan, standing in space and narrating a flashback of his and Donna's adventures. Donna chimes in too, breaking the fourth wall to the audience. Also, the first words of this glorious return are the Doctor saying, Once upon a time, Lord, which I think is sufficient grounds for tar and feathering Russell T. Davies. This whole sequence is kind of weird anyway, since the Doctor explains all this to another character early on. I can't imagine longtime Doctor Who fans will enjoy constantly getting hit over the head with all this exposition. Anyway, once Donna is done having her Iago moment, Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. The theme kicks off and it's just kind of okay. It's musically not terribly distinctive, but it's not offensive either. The TARDIS spins down a cloudy vortex and lands on a street that Donna and her daughter Rose just so happen to be walking down. The doctor seems happy and carefree and is inexplicably not suffering from post-regeneration. After an egregious amount of what's for nostalgia, the Doctor and Rose, it feels weird saying that, notice a spaceship crashing towards Earth. Donna implies that the Doctor is old and getting too fat to wear a tight suit, and the Doctor gets into a taxi cab that just so happens to be driven by Donna's husband. Sean doesn't recognize the doctor, but explains that Donna donated nearly all 100 million pounds of her lottery money to charity. This is extremely uncharacteristic of her. I know that she's subconsciously yearning for the life she had with the doctor, but she's still Donna. Anyhow, unit soldiers arrive at the crash site and suspiciously drags away a news reporter. The doctor enters the facility and emits a projection display of the ship from his sonic screwdriver, which I guess has that ability now. He explains to unit field agent Shirley that the ship didn't crash, but in fact, parked. That of course doesn't explain why the ship was on fire but now isn't, or how it nicely landed after hurtling towards the surface. Back on the streets, Donna and Rose are walking home when some dudes on bikes tease Rose for being transgender, calling him Jason. It's not enough that Rose exists. Instead, it has to be explicitly mentioned that he's dressing in female clothes. It's almost like they were worried that we would be convinced that Yasmin Finney is a woman. Once they get home, Donna's mother says that Rose looks gorgeous, and then has an awkward conversation about Rose being transgender. Sylvia is acting frightened of Donna, and is desperate to appear affirming. Donna is amused and contented with this behavior, acknowledging that Sylvia doesn't really approve. Meanwhile, Rose notices that a tiny spaceship pod has landed behind the house, and rushes back home to get his phone for some reason. On the way, he encounters the furry creature from the pod, called a meep. Back at the UFO parking lot, the doctor uses his screwdriver to conjure up a magic whiteboard and rattles off some gobbledygook to Agent Shirley. I don't know if this is the time to mention it, but the Yorkshire accent is one of the worst on the planet, and all Yorkshire peoples should be legally banned from acting by royal decree from the king. <laughs> but there's a second way that Shirley is disabled. Russell T. Davies can't be content with Shirley existing in a wheelchair. He just has to point it out. So a unit soldier apologizes for all the stairs in the building. Subtle as always, Russell. Next, the unit soldiers get possessed by some space mist from the spaceship. And despite the danger, the doctor rushes to Donna's house to meet Dobby. I, I mean the meep. No one seems suspicious that despite acting and talking like a child he was able to operate his pod and outmaneuver the Rorth warriors. After the doctor asks the meep what his preferred pronouns are, the possessed unit squad arrives and no one looks surprised. The doctor uses his screwdriver 
to lift the visor on a helmet to look at their glowy eyes. How did he know to do that, and why didn't he just use his hand, is never explained. The unit soldiers begin firing, and the doctor uses the sonic screwdriver to draw force fields out of thin air and physically pushes the shields around to provide cover. I feel like I owe Stephen Moffat an apology for complaining so much about how often the doctor waved the screwdriver around like a magic wand, scanning everything in sight during the Matt Smith era. The sonic screwdriver has become an all-purpose tool of increasingly convenient proportions. Doctor Who used to set itself apart by having the main character come up with logical solutions to his problems, but now he's just a button pusher with a flippant personality. But it doesn't matter anyway, because after the gang runs away, the force fields take more bullets than they can handle and inexplicably shatter like glass. Once upstairs, the doctor uses the sonic screwdriver to resonate the bricks in a brick wall so that they can simply push through. The hardened mortar would keep that from happening, of course, but the doctor succeeds anyway. It also doesn't seem to affect anything else for some reason, or create an ear-splitting pitch. The gang exits the house and gets shot at by green bug-eyed monsters, and climb into Sean's taxi, which is unscathed by the gunfire. They stop in a parking lot, and the doctor dons a wig that he pulled from his coat. He uses the screwdriver to teleport the Rarth warriors that were shooting at them to their location, and invokes the Shadow Proclamation, which luckily renders them docile. The Rorth warriors stand awkwardly on their CGI legs and use their tiny, inexpressive mouths to explain that the Meep is a dangerous fugitive who they are sworn to capture. Before anyone can do anything, the Meep kills the two Rorth warriors and refers to Rose as the Weird Child so that Rose can get extra victim points. It doesn't make any sense because the Meep doesn't know anything about humans, but whatever. The possessed unit soldiers arrive and knock out the Doctor for no reason and take everyone back to the spaceship parking garage. The Meep never explains why they're kept alive other than a throwaway line about possibly eating one of them. But the Meep does kindly explain his whole evil plan. Apparently, he will use something called a dagger drive, which will stab into the earth, use elements for fuel, and tear apart London in the process, which doesn't sound stupid or contrived at all. While the gang is being taken up to the spaceship, Agent Shirley rolls out of nowhere and with incredible aim uses projectiles on her wheelchair to put the soldiers out of action. She then launches a rocket from the chair to explode a wall, and the laws of physics are briefly defied. The doctor runs off alone, but Donna wants to go with him. Despite not knowing the doctor, Sean seems to understand that Donna's mind will burn if she remembers her adventures, and he tries to keep Donna back. Donna goes anyway, and finds the doctor rushing around and flipping switches. We see that the dagger drive is already causing devastation outside, but to make matters worse, a barrier comes down in the middle of the room between the Doctor and Donna. The Doctor says he can work with half a room, but gives up pretty quickly, and tells Donna that she will have to remember. The Doctor says a random string of words said by Donna back in Series 4, when her head was full of the Doctor's knowledge, and it wakes her up like it's the Winter Soldier activation code. She inexplicably bursts with regeneration energy, and after stopping the countdown, proceeds to seemingly die. The cavernous cracks that opened up in the streets of London somehow close up of their own accord, and it looks very silly. In an even sillier moment, Rose begins to talk science gibberish and push buttons in order to stop the meat. Every character exclaims, What? into the camera, including Donna. Rose exclaims the word binary several times before explaining that he shares the memories with Donna because they're related, which is completely banal and derivative. Rose ejects the meat from the spaceship, and the Rorth warriors take him away. Donna says the whole thing works because the Doctor is both male and female. 
Rose says the doctor wouldn't understand because he's a male presenting Time Lord. The funny thing is, they kept emphasizing the word binary and using the concept of two genders to back up their logic. I guess there's no room for being non-binary here. Next, Donna and Rose hold hands, and the Dr. Donna memory fizz irradiates away. Apparently, they could just let it go this whole time. The Dr. and Donna return to the TARDIS console room, which changed while they were gone. It's a massive white set full of ramps for wheelchair accessibility, and the time rotor looks like a giant bug zapper. The whole place looks like a cross between the X-Men's basement and Men in Black HQ. Overall, it's not too bad. It's just not terribly distinctive. The bright lighting and deep-set controls harken back to the 80s control room, at least. The doctor runs around gleefully yelling, This is amazing! This is amazing! And Donna responds with, It's gorgeous! which wouldn't be annoying if Russell T. Davies hadn't been doing it the whole time. Instead of letting us make up our minds about things, Russell is constantly telling us what to think through character dialogue. For instance, every character that comes across Rose describes him as beautiful, often multiple times. It's like Russell is trying really hard to convince the audience that he's a beautiful woman. Well, anyway, the TARDIS console dispenses Donna some coffee, despite being the flight controls, and Donna promptly spills the coffee, which causes the console to erupt into flames. The Doctor and Donna look on in horror as the special finally comes to a close. What a pointless slog of conveniences and contrivances. There's simply no story here at all. The plot details are laid out in quick scenes with short sentences, and then resolved with pure luck or... magic. The Doctor here is indistinguishable from a wizard. None of the characters go through any real struggle or change. Things just kind of happen, and then we're supposed to feel happy about it. This special was supposed to be the triumphant return of the Tenth Doctor and Donna, but Russell has made it abundantly clear that he doesn't give a damn about this reunion or having any semblance of a story. The plot here is paper thin and easily resolved through convenience. Instead of having respect for these actors, respect for the show, or respect for the fans, Russell has chosen to make this special a soapbox for transgenderism. You see... In a male-to-female sex change surgery, they invert the penis and use the flesh to create an open wound where the genitals were. The wound has to have an object shoved in regularly, or it will close over. The gaping flesh hole grows hair on the inside and secretes the substance that lubricates feces. In other words, it is gravely unloving to promote transgenderism, as you are encouraging the audience to get a hairy, pus-filled, festering pain crater that leaks poop juice. If consenting adults want to do that to themselves, that's their business. But lying to them about the nature of the beast, telling them that the crusty, decaying meat hovel is beautiful, so that you can feel morally superior, is indescribably unkind. I know that many of you will call me a number of names for these statements, but the raw truth is that I cannot, in good conscience, endorse transgenderism when it leaves the subject with a life of pain and agony. Russell T. Davies would know this if he knew anything about science, but he doesn't. He can't even write good science fiction. His quest to feel like a good person is so overwhelming that he is perfectly willing to destroy not only the 60-year legacy of Doctor Who, but to destroy his own legacy as well. I think that's partially why he insists on calling this the 14th Doctor. Why he insists on a new screwdriver and new TARDIS. On some level, he's saying what was done before isn't good enough that he shouldn't have had Davros be disabled. That this is his new legacy, 
the morally improved Doctor Who he wanted all along. But this isn't an improvement. This just kind of sucks. I'm sure some folks will enjoy seeing David Tennant and Catherine Tate back in action. And they're both fabulous actors. But to me, this just looks like more diminishing returns. I wish this hadn't happened and hadn't trivialized the serious ending of Series 4. It's almost like if you brought back Luke Skywalker and robbed him of his destiny of restoring the Jedi Order and bringing balance to the Force. Oh, wait. Anyway, if you're a true Doctor Who fan, you can watch the new colorization of The Daleks, which is pretty fantastic, although the new music is a bit much. And if you don't want to have to watch the specials, I'll watch them for you. And you can come back next week for a review of Wild Blue Yonder.